Hi, you're listening to the Rosenfeld Review, where we're just a bunch of blind men trying to figure out that elephant. And I'm uh, the, the chief of those stumblers, uh, Lou Rosenfeld. And I'm here with my guest, Wendy Johansson. Hi, Wendy. Hey, Lou. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on the show. Uh, I ran into Wendy just in the last few weeks. Uh, very interesting person. So interesting that I had to get her on the podcast. Uh, she's a product experience leader, currently a, a GVP at Publicis Sapient, and she focuses on building and scaling products and the design teams behind them, especially global ones. And uh, Wendy, I mean, you've like had some incredible experiences doing that. I mean, I know you were working at a number of early stage startups initially, and then you became a co-founder of WiseLine, which... I understand it's been a real successful experience. The company's now over a thousand people in eight countries. And I'm really interested in how you help build design teams in all those countries. I mean, you were telling me you started off in San Francisco and Guadalajara at the same time. And then you helped build offices in, in New York City, Monterrey, Mexico City, Ho Chi Minh City, Bangkok City, just a bunch of places <laughs> that are all pretty much exactly alike if I would, yeah. I mean, how, how do you do that? How do you, uh, you know, did, did you have to, first of all, um, was the first one that you did outside of the U.S., which I um, assume you are a native of, um, I mean, that first one was Guadalajara, right, besides yep. San Francisco. And had you done that before and uh, what, for, for another company? Yeah, actually, uh, a couple of years before that, the co-founders of WiseLine and I were actually, one of them was a co-founder of another company called Uyala back in what, 2006, seven maybe. And we had about two and a half years into that company, maybe three, uh, opened an office in Guadalajara where he's actually from. He, he's, his parents are from Guadalajara. Uh, and so he has deep roots there. And he opened an office in Guadalajara to be kind of our secondary engineering team. And I think one of the lessons that we learned there was opening an office years later in another country, it, it never felt equal mm. for the teams. They never felt kind of on par uh, with their counterparts in Mountain View at the time. And so when we started WiseLine, one of the big lessons we took from that was number one, there's amazing talent in Guadalajara. And number two was we have to do this day one so everybody's on equal footing. So there's no kind of secondary feeling, there's no offshore feeling. And at that point, we actually kind of had these had these big dreams of saying, you know, what if we could turn Guadalajara into the Silicon Valley of Mexico? Because everyone thinks of Mexico City, but that's more like New York, fashion, finance, speed. Uh, and when you think of Guadalajara, it was more like Austin about a decade ago, up and coming, burgeoning. We had some early American companies that opened there, like Kodak in the 70s was one of the first. They literally built this giant factory campus, which uh, we ended up later kind of buying part of it and building our own uh, little tech campus. And so the underlying roots were there. We just had to kind of transform that into digital tech as we move forward. And so you had that initial experience where there was this uh, inequity, at least in terms of feeling, and then you co-found the new company and you went in with this perspective of, okay, what, we, we need to make sure that they feel equal wherever the team is. Okay. How did you ensure that given that you know, the, the headquarters is still I, in one place, right? Was it based in San Francisco? Yeah, we, I mean, technically headquarters was there, but I, I kind of like to think about it as a VC quarters. Uh, that's where we got our funding and that's definitely where we got our reputation. Uh, but it really helped that half the co-founding team had very deep ties to Guadalajara. Vidal, who was later our CTO, um, ended up, uh, well, he's still there, uh, but was actually from born and raised in Guadalajara. So he's what we call a tapatio. Uh, and he very much kind of set that ground of like, I am here. I am that voice for this team. And later, uh, Matt Pashensky, one of our American co-founders, ended up moving down there for several years as well. So I, I spent, I think, 75% of my time in Mexico. I didn't permanently live there. And uh, Bismarck, our other co-founder, was our CEO, and he's the one who started with his roots in Guadalajara with his family. So the connection was there, and uh, as we continue to grow, it was, it was very much that feeling of keeping the team bigger there, 
keeping the voice louder there and ensuring that the teams that we grew within our San Francisco office were, they were curious, they were hungry. They wanted to know how they can pass on the things that they'd learned in their previous startups and, and this kind of entrepreneurial ownership culture that is kind of that myth of Silicon Valley where I think in the most recent years, it's kind of faded a little bit, but how we bring that kind of ownership down to Guadalajara and, and really change the culture of our team because we wanted them to build this product and them to build this company and them to have an impact on their community. Interesting. So um, that, you know, like that sense of equity between teams in, in different countries, it just sounds really challenging because, you know, there's already, I mean, if you look at many companies that are like 99% of them based in one country, in one culture, even in one building, you see um, unfortunate shades of competition between teams or groups inside a company. And I hear you're taking um, two teams that are separated by many miles, by language, by culture. Uh, and, you know, it, it, does that actually almost water down the competition? makes it like they're like you know like familiarity breeds contempt they they yeah. were they just like not <laughs> initially familiar enough with each other to, to to compete no i think there was just so much like people are so open i would say curious is one way to approach it but another another word that might be better fitting is we were embracing it you know our, our teams in the us every team that got started i think every month or so we would have a onboarding uh, that we would do in Mexico. So we would fly the team down there and they would get together with, you know, all our new hires in Mexico as well. And it would be facilitated in kind of this onboarding into understanding each other's work styles. It was the, I think, MBTI, Myers-Briggs type indicator. Uh, we had a facilitator who came in and taught everybody kind of where on each spectrum they were, you know, are you more introverted, extroverted? It's not, it's not binary. You could be an introverted extrovert. Um, or an extroverted introvert <laughs> along the spectrum and, and really helped everybody understand that that impacted their ways of communication and how they worked with each other. And it was also giving them an experience of Mexico that quite frankly, in the time 20, when were we 2013 to 2016, when we we're mm -hmm. still doing the onboarding like that, it really changed that kind of American media perspective of Mexico as like, oh, it's this dangerous place. And you went down there and people were way more friendly than you would ever find in the Valley. And it was incredible. So we really built this kind of more familial culture. And, uh, you know, here in Silicon Valley, we kind of make those jokes about the 20 something year olds. They stay at work till nine o'clock, but sure, after five, they're doing keg stands and playing ping pong. But in our teams in Mexico, people were bringing their families after five o'clock. We had a backyard and their, their kids would be running around. They, bring, they would bring their dogs and mm. it would be very much this kind of, close culture of just a community of people and their families um, or their friends or significant others. And, and that's something I think that helped us on the kind of more American side of the picture soften up and really build this more interwoven culture within the company. So it's interesting also because, you know, if from my outside perspective, it sounds like you had these two big divisions, which were, you know, maybe bigger than they, they sound bigger than they were in terms of culture and distance and language and so forth. But uh, it sounds like you designed an onboarding process that, among other things, enabled people to kind of see that they fit in two categories that cut across those two geographic and cultural divisions. In other words, things like Meyer Briggs, it's, it's just basically categorization exercises. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I'm an E who tends I, you're an E who tends I. Oh, okay, maybe we've got something in common, even if we're, you know, uh, thousands of miles apart because we're the only two in the room like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, what about language, though? Uh, were, did you, do you have, or did you have a, a lingua franca for the, the organization? Um, generally everything would be in English. Uh, that was kind of our common denominator, given that we were building a product that was being used, but mostly by companies at the time, uh, in the U S and later we extended over to the UK with some clients. And so the product was built in English. Um, the thing with Mexico, it's pretty easy by culture. I mean, most of the folks that were on our team early on, <clears throat> when I asked them how they had 
grown up with English, it was always video games. It was always movies. Um, and so they had picked up a lot of that there. But it also meant sometimes some people had uh, interesting takes on like what's, what's okay to say because, um, you know, something you see in a movie, they don't realize that it's kind of a bad slang you shouldn't say out loud. So we also learned on our end at the same time of there were certain slang that we had heard maybe on the streets in San Francisco. We learned from some people here uh, that we shouldn't be saying out loud in Mexico. So there, there was kind of this two way um, in, in embracing the kind of language barrier and, and culture. And it really wasn't a barrier uh, at the end of the day, although I would say it was a high bar that we set because we, do ex we did expect everyone to speak English in their interviews, uh, but we also, as we continue to grow, started softening that bar to say, you know, some people who perhaps couldn't be, you know, user testing facing or client facing yet with their English, we'd actually have programs uh, when they joined for the first three months where we actually had an English professor we hired on uh, full time and he would teach classes and improve the skills, not only in Mexico, but we later did that in Vietnam uh, and across other regions as well. Well, the, the it's a perfect segue to my next question, which is uh, if you're serving primarily an English speaking market, did you find that certain roles like, let's say, user researchers and uh, maybe UX writers ended up being stateside? No, they were all Mexico in the beginning. Wow. Uh, and even when we ran essentially, you know, those discovery UX workshops that that we often do with customers to really understand who are your personas, how do you back up into the problem uh, and all of that. I remember one of the first ones I did with my team uh, from Mexico, I think it was two UX managers and they had flown to New York City and we were about to go run a workshop with a client there. And I was on the subway with them and we're taking the subway up to Midtown, uh, up to the client's headquarters. And there was a moment when I realized, because I saw these two people on the uh, train greet each other and face kiss, which is what we do in Mexico. It's a face kiss, no matter if it's business or if it's personal or family. And I had this moment of panic, like, oh, how are these guys gonna introduce themselves? So immediately I turn around and I'm like, hey, introduce yourself to me as though I'm the client right now. And he leans over, tries to face kiss me. And he's like, hello, I'm so-and-so. I'm 27 years old. And I've been at WiseLine for exactly nine months. And I was like, no, 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 no. Let's talk about this <laughs> in business culture in the US. I was like, do not face kiss any of our customers. Um, give me a good firm handshake, like not a limp handshake. So we're, we're standing on this train, hanging onto the rails, like handshaking each other repeatedly. And I'm like, no, introduce yourself again. Introduce yourself again. Um, and so it was those kind of things in the spur of the moment. and and keeping mindful of the small details that over time, it kind of became part of our playbook because one of our things was if you dive into, you know, any kind of situation, building a new type of product, a new type of, you know, user validation, you're on a new type of call with a client, document your learnings so the rest of the team can learn from you because not everybody's always gonna have the same opportunities. And so what we wanted to do was also improve it every time. So not only in, in terms of how we built the product and the team, but also, if you're onboarding this week, it looks and feels like this, and you hit a couple of stumbles, document it so the person who joins in two weeks is gonna have a better time than you. So everything was always improving in our minds, we hope. Um, but, but it turned out so well so far. I think the team has onboarded about, uh, what, over a thousand people who are full-time right now, and I'm sure there's, there's a larger number that we can count uh, if we talk about folks who have been in and out. Well, we'll talk a little bit about uh, moving from uh, California and Mexico to uh, far distant continents in just a moment. We'll take a break. You're listening to the Rosenfeld Review. I'd like to catch my breath um, in the conference side of things. Uh, we just put two on uh, this autumn here in the Northern Hemisphere. We just did enterprise experience and design ops in the last couple of months. And uh, I can't rest easy because we have uh, another conference just around the corner. It's Advancing Research 2021. It takes place virtually March 10th through 12th. And uh, it is a conference for researchers by researchers. I'm working with an incredible team of curators led by Natalie Hansen, as well as Jamika Burge and Steve Portugal. This is the second edition of this conference. We are really trying to push research forward. This is not just a conference on how to do the basics of different varieties of user research, but this is really taking things a bit further because research, if you are involved in it, you know that we've reached kind of a, a tipping point. And so that's why we started the conference in 2020. 
If you want to know more about the conference, please go and check out advancingresearchconference.com. That's advancingresearchconference.com. Uh, research driven by researchers and for researchers. We hope to see you March 10th through 12th. And again, it's virtual. You're listening to the Rosenfeld Review with my guest, Wendy Johansson. Wendy, so um, we've been talking mostly about um, your experience uh, building, uh, uh, scaling up a design organization spread over San Francisco and Guadalajara. I know um, you, you also began building in New York and Monterrey, Mexico City, and then all of a sudden we're going in a very different direction. Uh, you... Um, moved over to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, uh, Bangkok, Thailand, and Sydney. Uh, and, you know, it occurs to me that, that those, well, certainly Ho Chi Minh City and Bangkok are very different places where, um, I mean, I can tell you as a book publisher, we rarely ever get our books translated into Spanish because almost everyone in the industry in Spanish-speaking countries seems to be able to read English. It's culturally not as big a, a leap as it would be for uh, people in Thailand or, or Vietnam, I would assume, if uh, my experience is an indicator. But what about for you? What, was it drastically different? Did you have to learn a lot of new things uh, that the experience in Mexico hadn't prepared you for? Absolutely. Um, but I'm going to first make a joke, which is actually the biggest language barrier I've ever had was with Australians. <laughs> I, I just cannot understand. One of my good friends is Australian. She and I constantly make jokes where uh, she has to translate herself to me. But uh, moving into kind of the cultural barriers there, it, it was very different for me, uh, in particular as an Asian American in Southeast Asia. Um, there was There was a a very warm reception as somebody who was coming from kind of Silicon Valley with these experiences, yet was Asian, um, I'm, I'm Chinese in background. And so there was recognition of just like, okay, you, you get us to some degree. You're not coming in as somebody who doesn't have uh, some sort of Asian culture. So that, that I think helped me in business there. Um, but the things that were completely shockingly new for me were just how differential people were to leaders in the businesses. Uh, as an example, in Thailand, um, similar to how one would introduce themselves if they were Mexican, but in the US for business, I had to teach my team because I've very quickly learned when we walk into a workshop with a client in Thailand, we do not immediately sit down at the main table. Um, in fact, even I, as you know, a co-founder and VP of whatever from WiseLine, I would sit against the back wall set of chairs with my entire team and wait until we as the vendor were invited to sit at the table with the big, you know, with the big bosses of the client. And to do so otherwise would be an extreme insult of thinking you're equal. So there were things that I had to quickly pick up on. And a lot of those things I would say I was more attuned to and less... I guess less offended or, or bothered by, because for me it was, okay, I understand a little more differentialness in Asian culture and, and I can accept that. Whereas I had to do a lot of explaining to some other team members about like, hey, you know, they clearly trust us. Why can't we sit at the table when we come in? It's like, well, it's a sign of respect and that matters a lot. We're always trying to get that seat at the table. Literal, yes, very literally in this case. Um, and uh, I, I would say in Vietnam for us, it, one time I remember one of my other colleagues telling me, you know, it's really good that you're Asian and, and a woman because we can't really tell how old you are. Like you could be anywhere between 25 and 40, um, but we're all going to assume you're 40 because the older that you are, you know, the more we're going to respect you. And I was like, okay, then we'll just go with that. <laughs> but that was an interesting one as well, um, as well as, you know, very different than in Mexico. There's a lot of women in business leadership in Southeast Asia, like a lot of them. And hmm. it was very almost gender equal with some of our clients. And, and that was very impressive. And for me, like great to see um, because Mexico is just a little different uh, in terms of business and especially technology spaces where there was a lot less women, much less women in leadership there. So uh, taking it back to scaling up your design organization, uh, how did this translate uh, no pun intended, in terms of uh, doing things like interviewing. 
It taught us a lot. And uh, one of the things that we, we ended up on as a company is something we called, you know, what is the highest common denominator? Um, you know, what is the highest kind of scale of what's, what's morally or ethically good in how we interview? As an example, uh, in some countries in Southeast Asia, when a woman signs a job interview, the company can actually write into her contract that she must promise contractually to not get pregnant in the next X years, or they can fire her and then actually take back some of her salary because then she would have, you know, basically reneged on her professional uh, contractual agreements. And mm -hmm. so those were things that we didn't do. We wouldn't ask those questions. Um, just like we don't want to know how old you are. We don't want to know if you're married. These things don't matter to us and impact your job. And so I think that very much opened a different culture where we had the types of people who were looking for companies that were more open-minded to them that would treat them differently. And I think that helped us kind of balance that culture as we came in to, to not pick up too many of, I guess, some of the more old school, traditional, patriarchal or hierarchical ways of work that happened in those countries. Um, as well as something that we called sourdoughing, because we're from San Francisco. Uh, we take a little piece of our teams that were successful. For example, when we first opened Vietnam, we took, I think, about a dozen people from our Mexico office uh, that are kind of up and coming future leaders, up and coming meaning in a few years in our company. And we moved them to Vietnam and we told them, you know, we have one goal here, which is to build the product that starting our off that's starting our office here, but second, to build that team to find the right people, to embed them with the same kind of decision-making and ownership. And in, in those 12 months, hopefully have found your successor in your role and be able to go back home to Mexico um, and give people that kind of cross-cultural experience, but also bring our company culture in, in a way that we wouldn't be able to do if we just hired 10 new people in that region. So, it, you know, I, I understand how you can... Um design let's see the hiring process or the onboarding process to you know around that lowest or the highest common denominator but was it challenging to make sure the people on the ground who were in management roles or, or managing the hiring process for example who may have been local shared those values and didn't you know sort of revert to muscle memory and ask questions that they might have in another context but they didn't yeah they shouldn't have been doing it for wise line yeah, and I think that was probably our most difficult challenge was finding the right leadership. That took us several turns to get right. And one of the things I think I, I observed that I would take into future companies as I continue to build those global teams is it really helps to continue building that base first, right? We wouldn't look to first hire that manager or leader. <clears throat> we would first look to hire those local uh, team members who are influenced by our sourdoughers um, to take on that culture so that that new leader who comes in is just as checked by those individual contributors as they are kind of by, you know, the leadership team above them. So they're being checked in both directions mm -hmm. that, hey, this is the culture of this company and who we are. You're not going to come in, in here and single-handedly change that for the worse anyway, hopefully for the, for the better. So, I mean, there, there's so much to this if, and we could obviously talk much, much longer, um, but if you were going to boil down your advice to someone who is just starting the journey of building an international organization, a design organization, are there a couple uh, uh, gems that you would pass on to them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the first would be very much in the vein of who we are as designers. We should be curious about our audience. We should be curious about the places that we're going and the teams that we're hiring. And recreate what is that highest common denominator based on the best things coming out of every team member, out of every office that we have. Um, as I like to sometimes tell folks, uh, we're only as good as our collective knowledge and our collective, quite frankly, ethics. So I think that's, that's really important is to be open-minded that, you know, just because we're coming from Silicon Valley, for example, doesn't mean we're, we're somehow better than anybody else. We just have certain types of experiences of building certain types of companies. That's it. Um, and then second is actually one of my favorite books is uh, The Culture Map by Erin Meyer. And she has, I think it's uh, seven or eight different kind of dimensions to measure cultures uh, from communication to evaluation, to leadership, to even scheduling. I think we've all read that popular article about how Italians tell time versus uh, Latin America versus China versus you know, other countries. Like 
being on time means anything from 15 minutes early to one hour late. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's understanding what all those things mean in the different countries and respecting that your worldview is literally not a worldview. It is your single myopic view from your country or your region. And now you have to go expand it and create something even better as you learn new, new, new regions, new peoples, and new cultures. Great advice. Um, and now I'm going to ask you for one more thing, a favor, actually. Uh, it's always great to wrap things up with a little uh, uh, gift to our listeners, uh, something or someone that you've encountered recently that uh, you think they should know about. Anything yeah, come to mind? Absolutely. Um, David Hong is somebody I follow on Twitter, and he's just this most delightful design leader. He's a design director at Webflow, and he recently uh, shared something called the career hype doc. And I really love it because, sure, we can remember our big career highlights, but what about all those small wins? What about those pieces of feedback that helped us improve ourselves? What about that continuity from company to company? Um, that you just kind of forget all those details. And so the career hype doc is really that longevity document that he kind of created and scoped out of how you should track your career and all those wins and all those learnings so that you capture them while they're still fresh. And I love the idea of that because as I see team members that I've worked with move from company to company and they're starting fresh every time again. Like, are you really, are you really building the best you? Because then you take another six months to find out new feedback from your new colleagues. And so I love the idea of this uh, career hype document because also sometimes you need some wins. You got to look back and be like, you know what? I have done things. Wendy, fantastic. Uh, again, I wish we had more time. I, I feel like, uh, you know, I find very little out there, frankly, uh, in the years that really is, you know, helpful for uh, dealing with uh, internationalization and globalization and localization, whether it's, uh, well, in my experience, when I was trying to figure out how to do information architecture for these huge websites that had to serve the world way back in the day. And, and now a, a lot of this work is just, you know, um, trying to guide the development of the capacity to do the design and the research and the product development. So it's great to hear from you. Great to learn from you. Really appreciate your coming on the show. Uh, this is uh, Wendy Johansson, and uh, a fascinating product experience leader. Uh, and if you want to know more, I'm sure you do. Look her up on Twitter at UX Wendy. That's UX Wendy, and she's got some links to other things she says and does uh, on the internet. Wendy, thanks again. All right, thanks a lot, Lou. Thanks for listening to the Rosenfeld Review, brought to you by Rosenfeld Media. If you like our show, please subscribe and review it on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast platform. I'd love it if you tell a friend to have a listen and check out our website for over 100 podcasts with other interesting people. You'll find them all at rosenfeldreview.com.